I'm going to call it processed marijuana. That's not the word in the statute. It's, if your husband was here, he would jump. Well, I know anyone that's passed a public safety bill on um, marijuana. I didn't need a speech. I was trying to think of that word in the statute. So if you have flowers, if you have that kind of marijuana. Extracts. Extracts. That's what it is? Extracts. Okay. If you have a marijuana extract, because back in the day, that meant you were probably doing big volumes of it because it wasn't like you were laying around in gummies all over the place. Marijuana extract is a felony in South Dakota. Uh, and, and the challenge then is that those folks that go to, who's from Colorado here, you go home and have a gummy and you drive back with your leftover bag of gummies uh, and when you cross the border into South Dakota, you're a felon. Um, and, and you may have no more marijuana in that than is in those flowers. I think that's just, there's nothing flowers about that. But, um, the, the level of THC could be the same in a bag of marijuana as in a couple of those gummies. One of them is a misdemeanor, the other one's a felony. We haven't adjusted to that. What the market has done and what the, where the public's attitude and this very generational difference. Um, so, so we're going to be talking about, or as well as this, is we're going to be talking about drugs. So come be an intern to get to learn a lot about drugs. Uh, we'll be talking about them. There'll be dozens of bills, not every year, for a long time. Um, Let's take some questions. I yes. got one. Thank you for coming to our campus today to speak. My name is Carly Healy. I'm the secretary of the BHSU College Republicans. State Senator, you have a history of using inappropriate, demeaning language within your official capacity as a legislator, ranging from calling your fellow legislative colleagues pond scum, calling your constituents wackadoodles, using words like fetish to describe grassroots activism, and using inappropriate phrases such as the bastard stepchild of local government. Please explain why your habitual and unapologetic use of foul, disgraceful, and rude language is appropriate for someone of your stature within the state legislature and state GOP, and whether or not your long-standing and well-documented pattern of generally disrespectful behavior is poisonous to serious public discourse. No, it's, Thank important. You. it's important. Thanks, Carly. And just to be clear, Carly's the only one here that's had security escort her out of the Capitol. So I want, to it's make, true. I want to make sure that you have a perspective. When I talk about wackadoodles, she's one of their cheerleaders. Um, the, uh, I, I used to call those people crazy, and I quit calling them crazy because it seemed kind of rude. So then I called them wackadoodles, and then they made buttons that say wackadoodles, and they wear them. Um, so it's, and the problem is that there are um, collections of people now, they didn't exist in politics 20 years ago, who are the burn the house down people. They don't care about good policy. They don't care about your families. They don't care about good government. They want to burn the house down. And I think it's wrong to treat those people like they're right, sane, normal. And they're not. They're disgusting. They're pukes. And you have to find a way to make sure that the public understands that that's what those people are. They're not normal. They're not. So when, you, when I go home, my 25,500 people, I got like 20 wacky people to me. And they go to meetings and they speak up. But the rest of the people, thousands want to know that the people that represent them aren't crazy and don't listen to that. Um, the uh, the um, reference to the bastard stepchild, that's a misquote, by the way. It's worse than that from your perspective. Um, I refer to county governments as the uh, redheaded bastard stepchild of local government. I said that on the floor this last year, and the next day, a representative of the townships came to me and said, that's not fair. The townships are the red-headed bastard stepchild of the government. Because the problem is these people, they're part of that wackadoo crowd, they don't understand that what I was saying is how we fund county governments isn't right. We put all the worst responsibilities on counties and we don't give them money to do the job. And so that's the point. It's not inappropriate. In fact, it's, it's so clear that people are quoting it uh, across the state of South Dakota. So, go ahead. Could you give an example? Uh, like, I'm just confused. Like, what's a wackadoodle position, or uh, what policy positions do people who want to burn the house down take? Oh, it's good. In South Dakota. You know, I try and spend a lot of time not thinking about those people. But uh, I'll give you a recent one. The Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, uniform Commercial Code is how we do business in every state in America. It's how we protect the power of the state to decide commercial transactions as opposed to the feds. The wackadoodles, when the proposal to update 
the Uniform Commercial Code uh, was out this year, which now references some cryptocurrency kind of issues, because guess what? It exists. They thought, and they go on their own little radio networks that you and I don't listen to, wouldn't want to, don't even know how to find them, and they tell each other that this is a conspiracy to overtake your money system. And in fact, one of them, one of them said, if you pass this, they'll take all your cash. Cash will be illegal. That's just stupid. Um, I mean, and, 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 and it'd be wrong to treat it like it's not stupid, because it is. Because if you do that, then people wonder, is, could that be right? No, you have to dispel those kinds of things. Um, let's see. That's the worst one from this last session. But, uh, God, he had so many. Um, can't grab one off the hat cup. I mean, they're smiling. They can all think of it. But that would be a pretty good example, thinking that the government's trying to make cash criminal. Um, next question. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, my question is, uh, since there's like such like a big like supermajority of Republicans in both the South Dakota House and Senate, uh, how often do we see like bipartisan like compromise when trying to create legislation? That's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure if, it's not like you would think, uh, I'm gonna say there's better relationships um, than you might perceive, but I, wa I wanna make sure we, uh, for context, it's not like Washington, okay? Because that's all you guys see the national news, and so when you hear they made a bipartisan deal it happens so rarely, it's like seeing a purple elephant or something, right? That's not how our world works in peer. Um, and at the national level, they so hate each other that um, you see that acrimony, um, and, and that's just not our world. So for example, we only have four Democrats in the state Senate, um, but quite frankly, two of the four vote with us more than uh, with their leadership. Um, Say Liz and Rand, yeah, um, and and there. I mean, we reach out to. Them. In fact, we have a uh, signal group. Okay, how many know what signal is? All right, I'm cool with you guys because it's an app on a phone. It's something like your generation thing that somebody, one of your kids, showed me, um, and it's a messaging deal. And we have a group that's all the senators, um, all of them that belong to a caucus. There are two that don't, but the 33 that do are on it and Democrats and Republicans, and we interact with each other um, all the time. So I think we have, matter of fact, Senator Larson's coming up and staying at my house to go pheasant hunting with some other senators this winter, and she's a Democrat. We even allow Democrats with guns. For them. Do you send memes in this group chat? Do we send memes in that group chat? <laughs> Me memes? Let me tell you. It is. Yeah, we have. I'm very curious. I don't know about. No, we don't. No, there are some memes. They'll put some, but mostly we're real people with real lives. So we send pictures. We don't have to have characters. Of, no, we don't have to have a character of an event. We have real events. <laughs> Somebody have a hand. Senator Schoenbeck. Why did you vote against HB 1133 this session, a bill that would have prevented private companies from seizing farmland against the will of property owners for a Green New Deal project? Yeah, okay, first off, that's a very stilted way to describe that law. It was but, one sentence. <laughs> no. You said that didn't exist. No, uh, but your description of it would be inaccurate. First off, it doesn't take anybody's private property. Secondly, uh, the United States Constitution does not allow you to take anybody's... It's eminent domain. Yeah, I know it is. You know what that means? Tell me what it is. <clears throat> eminent domain is taking private property with compensation for public use. Now... Okay, so you know I, what it means. So, so, you, so first do, off, you know it's just compensation. You can't take somebody's property. And you know there's a procedure, right? you got to follow statutory procedure to get there. Is it public use to build a CO2 pipeline? It, it is, but you don't yeah, like it. I get that. Who's, uh, who's publicly using... Uh, the CO2 pipeline. Who's fermenting corn into ethanol so you and don't piping drive those emissions into rocks yeah. in North Dakota? Yeah. How, how many no, of you no, would no, use no, that pipeline? Take that, take that. We're talking. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can let people get the stage here. Uh, Senator Schoenbeck here has been uh, in the Capitol for 60 years. He's going to come here and tell you that uh, he can't listen to his constituents and he can't do the right thing on this issue. He voted to kill HB 1133. 
which would reform the eminent domain laws so that corporations can't come in and take people's farmland against their will. They do not want to sell their land. They don't want this pipeline, and the companies are coming in, they're threatening them, and they're suing them to take that farmland. That's wrong. He talks about doing things in the interest of, uh, of his constituents. He's certainly not doing that. So we need to uh, pass this bill. Probably need to kick Schoen back out of office. Uh, maybe, actually, that's a certainty. I think we can be pretty confident on that one. And there's a lot of other stuff that we need to do. The other question I want to ask you but is... I've got to answer that one. So. Plus, I'm pretty sure nobody came to listen to you. But that's maybe. what I was going to say. No, but I wanted, because I wanted people to hear. You said, should you listen to the loud, you know? No. That's what you get. I, that, that gets back to that question about whether you should use your judgment or not. I'll, let's go through some other things. You can't take anybody's property. There's a procedure set by law. It's just, we've had it for 100 years. Um, and, and you can have an argument about, oh, and, and you can't threaten somebody to give you property because ultimately they can say no. And you've got to follow the procedures that we have established since the United States Constitution was created. So he doesn't like the way the founding fathers set up to address those issues. Um, and, and the issue about carbon capture, I can care less about carbon capture. I do care that you have fair laws. And I'll tell you what I really care is you have to be scared of demagogues who have an opinion on one project and they want to come and change the laws to favor them. Because here's what you ought to worry about. What happens if next time they don't like you and they want to yell and take the mic and be speaking in places to go after you? And that's what you can't have. And that's what I don't agree with. I'll fight people like that every day of the week. And you'll never get a chance to vote me out of office because I'm not running again. Um, but I'll tell you, I've had people like that say that every election I get about 60% of the vote every time, but I've never knocked on the door of my district. Um, so, I'm with that story. More questions? No, you already had your shot. I, I, I think people have had enough of you. Um, <laughs> Mr. Wall, what do you want to know about? I want to listen to his question, actually. <laughs> Let's hear your question. Second question. Uh, why did you suspend Julie Freimuller from the state because Senate and deprive 25,000 citizens no, of their representation in Pierre? No. How is that constitutional no. or lawful? Listen, okay, let me tell you what he's talking about. So we had a senator, after she got a memo that said, there's certain behavior you shouldn't do, she did it anyway. And here's how weird it is. She takes her and her husband, and they go into an office that's about as deep as me to you, about that wide. The desk is right there. They sit in front of it. She's actually, I think, starts on talking about a bill, but she doesn't stop there. The next thing she does is she asks this newborn, this mother of a newborn, um, whether or not uh, she's had her child vaccinated. She's not any business of any legislator to be asking any parent that subject. It's just not their business. This is a business setting. When she said she did, then she started explaining to how her child could die. And this is a newborn child. First child. Does that end there? No, this, this, is, this isn't, the, that's not where it ends. Then she says, are you breastfeeding? Um, oh yeah, with her husband sitting next to her. And, uh, and she says, uh, no, I can't or something. Then she starts explaining how you should, and how you could start it up again if your husband would suck on your breasts, and she's, and she's demonstrating how with, the, her, with her breasts, and the husband is sitting next to smiling and nodding to one of our employees after a memo went out saying no behavior like that. Um, and so, yeah, she got suspended. You kicked her out over political differences. You're making stuff up. And that's another problem with those loud people we're talking about. They don't care about facts. She got elected. You took away her voting When you ask about what a wackadoodles believe in, they don't believe in facts. That, for example, in this instance... The fact is, hey, you voted... Sir, 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 this is, not, this is not what this is for. All right? This is an education experience for my students. You want to hear the right thing. Who are you, anyway? Anthony Mirzians. Oh, I don't know who that is. But, um, <laughs> yeah. So, anyway... I have a question. Go ahead. One of the critiques we hear of the national legislature is that it's nowhere to be found. It's too uh, quick to push it over to the Supreme Court. Or I, I, I missed a word. You said the national. The national Congress. Okay. I'm curious if this critique of the national Congress applies to the state level Congress. The critique is that Congress at the national level 
is too quick to push things over to the courts or let the executive branch take care of things. That Congress is missing in action. Does something similar apply to the legislature at South Dakota level? I, 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 the short answer I'm real confident is it doesn't, it's not the same. I think if I had to understand what goes on at the national level, it's they have the most cumber. I mean, if you if you come and serve as an intern at a legislature and then go serve an intern in Washington, they did that. I I couldn't believe um, how slow and ineffective, inefficient the Washington situation is. Um, and so when they're missing an action, it's because their system is almost designed for no action. So they have to they default to other people making the decisions. More often, quite frankly, the administration and the rules process. Um, fills the void. Somebody's going to fill the void if there's work that needs to be done. Um, at the state level, it's just way more responsive. So, and, and, the, and our courts, at the, our Supreme Court, all the time talks about how deferential they are to the, to the legislature, for example. Um, so they, they're rare to step in where we are, and we're pretty quick. If, um, I mean, our, our things are like, uh, I got a call from the legal counsel for the Pelican Lake Conservation District, and there was a, something in their statutes that were interfered with them being able to do business the way they needed to. He's a lawyer, I said, draft up the thing, email it to me, and promise me you'll come and testify. I introduced it, he came and testified, it's the law now. Um, I mean, we can, we're so, it's so easy to be responsive uh, in South Dakota, because usually in the, even the people I disagree with you obviously know some of these legislators, and if they have a problem, they can go to them, and I'm sure those legislators will introduce legislation to attempt to fix those problems. It's, we're just way more responsive. Randy? Well, I think one of the points that I would point out is we have 400 plus bills a year. Every bill gets a hearing. At the congressional level, a bill only gets a hearing if the chairman of the committee allows it. So every bill, we, we at least get a hearing to a committee, and that, that's a substantial difference. Uh, and, and there's an important point there that Senator Divert's making. Um, in, back in the 70s, South Dakota changed their procedures. Prior to the 70s, we had, uh, you didn't have to give a bill a hearing. Uh, you didn't have to sign it to a committee, but if you did, the chairman could take it, and the chairman could do whatever he wanted with it, and the chairman might have a hearing, but he might not invite anybody to it. Or he might only have the committee members there, and they shut the door of the public, no testimony, the chairman does what he wants with the bill. In the 70s, we changed our rules. So now, every problem that they can find some legislator to introduce a bill on is going to get a hearing. It might not, you know, it might, might not be a good idea, it might die at the hearing, but everything gets a hearing, and it's a public hearing, and it has to have 48 hour public notice posted, so people know about it and show up. So, we're, that's another part of how much more responsive our system is. Yes, ma'am. Have you been to the White House? <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, actually, um, to tie into why you ought to go be an intern, um, I did it when I was an intern uh, in Jim Abner's office, and uh, I was at a, I did, did railroad stuff for him, and I, I went to this conference at the White House. Let me tell you two quick White House stories. I went to a conference at the White House. I go to the gate you're supposed to go in. They said it's in the family theater through there. I walk over, walk in the door, and I say to somebody, what would it stop me if I would just wanted to like go for a stroll and see the Rose Garden? They said the snipers on the roof. <laughs> um, and if you go, if you're in DC and you're on the elliptical there, ellipse, you know, and at sunset you can see the silhouettes of the snipers on the roof. I mean, they really are there. Um, the other side about why you ought to go be an intern um, is uh, I, uh, I when I was an intern for Senator Abner or then Congressman Abner. Um, there was just so much fun stuff to do. We had softball we were playing on the malls where the softball teams played there. And uh, Raleigh Dolly, you remember Governor Mickelson died in a plane crash? Um, one of the guys on the plane with us was a guy named Raleigh Dolly, and he was my intern. And um, yeah, so I guess I wasn't in, I was back after being an intern. And um, Raleigh was the most handsome guy you've ever seen, far and away. Jim Abner used to say we took Raleigh along for fate. Um, <laughs> we could go out at night. And this, this beautiful lady, I can't remember her name, but Raleigh meets her, and she works in the White House. And they apparently have parties on Friday afternoon at the White House, and all the important people leave. And Raleigh would go, and he'd say, hey, you guys, come on, we're not going, we're going, we're all the young people on the hill hang out. We did, so I, 
I passed on three or four chances to go drink beer in the White House. Raleigh, bring back the pictures. It was after Jim Brady got, when Reagan got shot, and he, Jim Brady had a little bear in his chair the whole time. Raleigh had pictures, they had pictures in the Oval Office. Um, so I think if you go and hang out there and want to, it's not that hard to get in. <laughs> Next question. Yes. So I, I understand why your opinion on the marijuana law, but can you explain it to the people? Like, I want to know your take on it, and because there's a lot of people that disagree. Which, which, which one? You know, remember I said we got like 25? Yeah, yeah. So what part of it? Legalizing marijuana, why do you think we shouldn't? Okay, I hear about all right. Because um, I'm working. Um, and, and, uh, and I'm not changing uh, my position. Um, and again, it's a generational difference, without a doubt. Without a doubt, if people under 45 were the only ones voting on recreational marijuana, the difference uh, it would be a night and day difference. Um, so, uh, and, and when you say legalizing, you're going right to that. Um, I hate to say liberal conservative, it's going to engender a political, uh, philosophical concept, and it's not that, it's liberal versus more conservative versus less. The position of legalizing marijuana would be, you know, way on one end of the spectrum. There's all kinds of things that could happen between now and then, and some already have. And my guess is you're going to see incrementally changes because of the generational difference. And I, I, I struggle with this, but I, I'm understanding the people my age are dying. Um, and so the people your age are going to be the majority in, in short order, and, um, and then people that grew up with the experience and the opinions my generation have, uh, won't be making those laws. I don't know if that's a very good. Not every, by the way, um, as that answer just shows, not every position every person has in life or in politics is all that intellectual. Um, they, they, they can be uh, because of where you grew up, um, what you think because of who you associate with, and they might not be the most logical reason. And, and you can find that out if you go to the coffee shop and start talking. Um, but in the legislature, we have, and I, I, you've already heard me express an opinion, I can tell you that Michael Roll, Senator Maverdeen, would be happy to debate with me for hours about why I'm wrong. And I just say, that's fine, I'm just wrong. I'll take it. Um, and Liz, isn't that true? I mean, not, Liz has got all kinds of opinions I think are crazy. Um, and, and, and she. I'm with you on But she's never changing an opinion just because I disagree with her. Or, or what I say to her, she never changes her mind. Except to come have lunch with me in my office once in a while. Um, other questions? Anybody else? Looks like one more and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, go ahead. So, Yay. when I lived in Minnesota, so it was just legalized. But what is, do you have the same idea on medical marijuana then? Or how do you feel about like that? Actually, excellent question. See this one right here? It is almost impossible to know what your constituents think about an issue. But I know one. Medical marijuana was on the ballot. And the South Dakota voters, like 70%, and look, and I think it's goofy. I don't think it's medical in any respect. There's no such thing as a prescription, no such thing as how much volume, you know, and if I have my friend Michael Roll here explain to me why you need 12 plants because they're different stages of germination and some are for headaches and others are for polio. And that's all garbage. No, that's true. Um, but the voters, remember I said you can have irrational positions too. The voters overwhelmingly said they want medical marijuana. And that's one of the few subjects where I think we know where the voters are. So I will uh, defend, I don't like it, don't agree with it, not using it. But I'll defend that the, the public policy of South Dakota should be um, supporting medical marijuana because until the voters tell us otherwise, they've clearly said that. And sometimes, many times, ballot issues have a lot of other stuff thrown on, so you can't tell. And the best example would be that recreational marijuana one that the court reversed. There was five different things in there. I mean, medical marijuana was on it, and it got less than medical marijuana got. They brought the ballot at the same time, um, so you couldn't. Anybody takes that and says, see, we support recreational marijuana in South Dakota. That's not true. I mean, you could, that's, but that would be misstating what the ballot, people can't amend them. They just got to go vote with them the way they put on the ballot form. But medical is clear. And it's rare we have an issue like that. 
Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Please, everyone, help yourself to the cookies, the lemonade, and coffee. <laughs> 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 <laughs>